may not be so familiar with our collections. And we are hoping this way to, of course, expand our outreach and invite uh, more and more people to come and work here, work with these archives and develop new research projects out here. So this is the overall intention of this series, uh, to begin with some of our own students and young researchers and build a larger outreach around it. Now, Jigisha's work is, has been uh, on the history of uh, early history of photography in the city of Calcutta. Uh, and she'll be talking really about that work. We're at uh, the center of her work for two studios of North Kolkata. But of course, she's built a larger history around the story of these two studios and also the question of disappeared archives. So while we are thinking here about documenting and collecting photography, uh, it's also uh, important to understand often how difficult uh, archiving can be because um, often uh, studios which you would have thought would be an obvious place for finding them are not. Our photographic uh, archive, which is the coming in of photography collections into our archive, began within a few years of the archives, uh, the visual archives starting off in 1996. And they came largely from three broad sources, families, collectors, and practitioners of photography themselves. But for all these three, so the studios were not a source for us. They were families and many of the family photographs would have been taken in studios. But for all these, uh, the central person who really uh, enabled this collection to grow uh, and somebody I would like to especially remember is Shiddhar Tugosh. Uh, he, was, I mean, he wrote a pioneering book called Chobitola, Bangali Photography Chacha. And a lot of the material that went into the book were at that point part of his personal collection. Uh, so family studios, actually, you know, he collected photographs from those and compiled his own large archive, which he allowed us to fully document. So in some sense, the launching pad was an extraordinary resource that he had put together. Some of it uh, will come up, I think, because he acquired a lot of studio photography. So some studios obviously threw up a lot, others may not have collected. He introduced, so family collections also came to us through him, uh, through his collection. And we also, through his contacts, acquired some actual photographic collections from certain families, which have grown since. Uh, through Shiddhat Ghosh, we also got access to some very important photographers in the city who were then aged, but still alive. And we were very, very fortunate to be able to access their collections. And I have to remember here Ahmed Ali, uh, meeting him through Shiddhat Ghosh and him giving us 500 photographs from his own collection, which is one of some of the most treasured photographs in our archive. Also, Devulina Mojumdar, a lesser known figure, uh, one of the early women amateur photographers, but who was part of several professional organizations. We were able to document her full collection and we are hoping sometime in the coming months, we'll be able to mount an exhibition of her works along with that of her sister, Monovina. And also we were introduced to families of two important photographers, Orimal Goshami and Kamakhi Prashat Chattopadhyay, who were part of a very vibrant circle of intellectuals, writers, scholars, and artists in 50s and 60s Calcutta. And a lot of portrait photography and photography or radio performances came to us from their family collections. So in some ways, through the one single source and a remarkable resource he was, Shiddhat Ghosh, we were able to expand out to a very wide field. So by the early 2000s, we already had a very substantial uh, documented archive on an early history of photography.
with that, I think um, I'll let Jigisha really uh, take over from here. Briefly to introduce Jigisha, I don't have anything written here on me, but Jigisha studied English in Presidency College uh, and then went on to do her master's at JNU, following which she came to do an MPhil with us at the center. Um, I think she is a 2016-2018 batch, right, Jigisha? Or 2017-19, right? 1719. Yeah, 1719. Sorry, I got the dates wrong. She worked with me on her MPhil thesis, uh, out of which she'll be presenting today. Uh, so she's currently an assistant professor at Jindal University in Delhi, where she teaches English. So over to you, Jigisha. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tapadidi, for that uh, very generous introduction. Um, I'm very happy and thankful at the same time for organizing this. I'm very thankful to Rosinkadi, to Prachidi, to you, Tapatidi, and everyone else um, at C Triplis for organizing this. Um, I have had my, you know, I have done my research both in JBMRC. I have done uh, parts of my research with the archives available at JBMRC as well as uh, the ones at which are stationed at CCPLUS itself. And I'll be talking about them briefly while uh, talking about the uh, piece today. Um, let me just share my screen before I can start my talk. Yeah. Is my screen visible to everyone, Prachati? Yes. OK. Um, <clears throat> This today's presentation actually borrows from my MPhil dissertation, as uh, Tapatidi said, which was on city, locality, and the image archive, a social history of photographic practices in early and mid 20th century Calcutta. Now, it was an attempt to write a social history of the once thriving and now steadily disappearing photographic studios and to understand the networks of people who were associated with the photographic process as such. My dissertation includes several practices, including the pedagogic and aesthetic conventions of photography, the specific location of the photographic studios, the advertisements of services offered by the studios, as well as a study of how photography entered the realm of the printing press as associated with the texts as such. In today's paper, however, I specifically want to situate the questions of availability and crisis, as Tapatiti also hinted at, of the image archive when it comes to photographic research, especially of the space of early professional photography. Uh, today, I talk about the small image archive I was able to gather through my field work in two studios in the Chitpur Shobha Bazar area, C Bros and Studio Divine. Additionally, I would also talk about the advertisements, prints, and photographs from the CSSS and JVMRC archives, which helped me situate the larger realm of early professional photography as it happened in Calcutta. The purpose of today's presentation is to try and situate the photographic medium, not as a specific lens to history, but as a processual history, which is to see the many communities, the many practices which were involved in the process of early professional photography. I want to explore this construction of a photographic community that involved the practitioners, the studio professionals, the clients, as well as the multiple networks of photographic reception. Through such an inquiry, I would like to deliberate on the question of the archive, its gaps, fissures, and richness, as intrinsic to the question of a social history of photography. Now I would come to the first question of the Bengali-owned photographic studios in Calcutta. Photography in the context of India arrived in India in 1840s. The supposedly unbiased new technology of photography aided the early mechanisms of disciplinary production of colonial knowledge. This medium helped document the diverse colonized tribes and people and to neatly classify them as subjects of anthropological inquiry. The People of India volumes and other postcards with racial profiling of the natives of India stand as a proof to that. This is how photography played a foundational role in the production of the disciplines of natural history, cartography, archaeology, and anthropology in the colony. 
photography also became integral in setting up and functioning of the different governmental surveys post 1857 in the new knowledge state in British India. As the modern technology of photography entered social and cultural worlds in India, the city of Calcutta first became one of the first to accommodate this device into its public life. To meet the demands of an amalgamation of people, the city of Calcutta, much like the other presidency cities, contained a number of British-owned photographic studios as the camera ventured into India in the late 19th century. The flourishing of photographic establishments in the colonial city had its own meandering flow as it got intercepted into the world of a rising Bengali entrepreneurship. The Shahidpara studios in the white town of Calcutta's then southern part consisted of the large British-owned establishments across the streets of Park Street, Esplanade, up to the Wellington area. These primarily catered to a rich, predominantly British clientele. Even the city's indigenous elite, however, aspired to get their photos captured in these studios. On the other side of the city, the Bengali-owned photographic studios dominated the black town. Starting from Chitpur in the northern part to the Bobazar area in central Calcutta, in the juncture between these two parallel entrepreneurial currents existed an amalgamation of different studios which were mainly owned by Muslims, Parsis, and other such communities. Early, these are, this, this was a map which was constructed from uh, a map by the Survey of India uh, published in 1910 to place the, the different um, photographic studios owned by Bengalis which were there uh, across the northern region uh, in Calcutta. Early professional photography in Calcutta demonstrated the development and progression of efforts at mastering a decidedly European technological import and the construction of a community around it. The first commercial Bengali studio, the Bengal Photographers, was established in Bobaza Street around 1862. Another such studio in the vicinity was the Calcutta Art Studio, established in 1876. Following these two, there was a number of photographic studios under Bengali proprietorship, which were established in North Calcutta, broadly around the area, as I said, from Shobha Bazaar to the adjacent areas of College Street and Bo Bazaar. The main studio locality or studio para, however, would be situated around Dalhousie Square, Esplanade, Benting Street, and John Bazaar areas. Barring one or two exceptions though, almost all of the Bengali-owned photo studios were situated in and around North Calcutta. In early and mid 20th century, photography did not quite achieve the character of a mass media entirely as we see today. Neither did it entirely remain accessible only for a certain section of society, which happened in the uh, beginning of the photographic medium or beginning of the photographic practice in India. The democratization caused by the print and the photographic medium opened up for new middle-class Bengalis a range of professional, entrepreneurial, and discursive possibilities. The photographic studios especially played a major role as a dialogic side between localized and global techniques of the media. The Shobha Bazaar Chitpur area was a well-known well social and cultural space where the city's colonial intellectual, artistic, and architectural heritage intersected with the community-oriented livelihood and practices for decades. The space generated a range of craft-based practices, such as the making of conch shells or shakha work, uh, gold metal work, print making, mold making, and sweetmeat shops. The urban geographic locale, with its vibrant culture of print and publishing and new artisanal and professional livelihoods, created a cultural and visual space that was quite distinct from the Shahipara studios for the Bengali-owned studios in North Calcutta. The establishment and proliferation of photographic studios in this area was a part of the larger network of its thriving commerce. These studios received imported photographic equipment, manuals, brochures. They learned to sometimes follow, sometimes intervene in the established aesthetic of photographic productions. These studios also became sites which negotiated a space between documentation and performance. They spoke to local demands and global aesthetic at the same time by the very virtue of how the photographic medium was shaping up. 
From the pioneering journalist and researcher Siddhartha Ghosh's collection uh, in the visual archives of CSSS, one finds many photographs captured and produced in, this, in these studios. From these various cabinet cards, one gets to know some of the first Bengali-owned photographic studios, such as those of Bengal photographers C. Guha, Kamala Studio, Calcutta Art Studio, D. Rathorn, and many other firms of individual amateurs and professionals. Looking into this area, for example, the Shobha Bazar Chitpur area, we see how the center of early Bengali cultural modernity affected the nature of photographic productions in this area. In studios, as we know, the objective technology of photography was integrally tied to a certain kind of staging of the photographic event as it captured portraiture. This performative aspect of the studio photography resulted in a domestication of space corresponding to the value systems of the photographer and the photographed subject. Studio photography portrayed a sense of a certain kind of planned spontaneity. This pitched the studio photographer into different roles of setting a quasi stage, of composing the casts of characters and of directing the photographic event. On the other hand, the photographic subject was at the same time a client and a performer. Many times the client and the photographer had differing degrees of negotiation about the nature of the final photograph to be made. A cabinet photograph by Bengal photographers in the 1890s, one of the early ones that we find, captures a group of children in their various standing and sitting arrangements amidst different props. The young child is seen to be seated in the center with the others accompanying him. The different garments and styling of their apparels probably indicate the special occasion that demanded such a photograph to be captured in the first place. While it marks the entry of children from a certain social class into the space of photography, it also vividly captures the different clothing conventions for children, which range from full adult attires to ones specifically designed for children as well. This one is a close shot from a mound board impression used by Calcutta Art Studio. Here we see how distinctly the calligraphy was engraved onto the cabinet card board to keep the name of the studio a sort of permanence. As these cabinet cards would move around in private circles of familial and social ties, the engraving would make sure that a proliferation of the studio's name and commerce happened. As the studios predominantly excelled in the art of portrait and family photography, the cabinet engraving played as important a role to familiarize the studio as did its beautiful photographic portraitures. From C. Guha, which was established in 1920, we see um, another leading Bengali owned photographic studio, this one situated on Mahatma Gandhi Road, College Street, we have a cabinet photograph which was produced in the 1920s. This photograph shows two women sitting together and holding each other on a single chair. This photo, apart from delineating the aesthetic portraiture conventions of the time, also hints at the probable forms of sociability which were deemed worthy of being photographed. The high probability is that these two women were related to each other via familial ties or they were friends. Their garments and ornaments suggest their social position, positions in very rudimentary ways and outline the conventions of studio poses as well, which are prevalent around the time. Now, these women perhaps had to venture because either because they really wanted to or because they did not have access to the luxury of home photography, had to venture outside of their homes to the physical space of the photographic studio and in turn endangered a certain kind of domestication of the space of the studio itself. Now, these were a couple of cabinet cards which were uh, sourced from the c archives. And now we would move to the uh, the, the, the resources which we get through advertisements which speak of professional photography. With the advent of new printing techniques such as lithography, chromolithography, and oleography in the late 19th century, there was a rapid proliferation of mechanically reproduced and widely circulating visual images, which were targeted for public consumption. Advertising was one such of the new visual print genres 
products which ensured publicity and popularization of the products and services through their visual circulation in the market by the mid 20th century it emerged as a separate department in the government art school in calcutta advertisements fast made it to a network of professional print and design circles with the rising demand of publicity for industrial and entrepreneurial ventures while photography would later play a key role in the visual repertoire of the art of advertising in the early 20th century it marked another way of inhabiting the space of commercial art a range of newspaper and journal uh, articles about advertisements the photographic studios sorry a range of newspaper and journals about advertisements the photographic studios and their equipment of the early and mid 20th century reveal to us a twofold understanding of this space of studio photography firstly it opens up the consumer market which was presumed by the entrepreneurial establishments and secondly it allows a reflection on the cultural cues which were prevalent in the commercial art sector during that time Let's consider some of the early advertisements of Bengali owned photography studios and the services that they offered. For instance, these are two advertisements of the SC Mitra and Co, uh, the the Calcutta uh, photo studio owned by uh, Bengali entrepreneurs. This was situated in Narkel Bagan Calcutta. Um in 1913, they issued an advertisement in the journal Probahini. on their ability to utilize their new material resources for half tone imaging the advertisement carries an expressive dramatic text alongside the half tone photo of an ornately framed possibly british couple the text in the advertisement can be loosely translated as follows chobi chobir moton ho proyojon a photograph should be picturesque just like we are delighted with beautiful photographs if a photograph is not picturesque we are disheartened in these days of photography there are just too many in the world of advertisements books etc but how many of them qualify as picturesque we can confidently say not even one of them to remedy the situation we have spent a lump sum to import the machine machines from for half tone photography from britain we prepare monochrome and color photographs for very cheap in no time the colored blocks are made within just 48 hours you should check it for yourself that's what uh, the 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 advertisement says this advertisement particularly hints at the pervasive existence of images <coughs> at a time which we today look back on as a prehistory of the image world this proliferating image images were being newly enabled by the printing and half tone technologies which greatly characterized the practices to be performed in the photographic studios the utilization of subtext in this advertisement also needs a separate mention in a rudimentary translation for example the caption would suggest a photo should be like a photo or an image should be like an image when we translate chobi or most appropriately a photo should be like a picture implying that it should meet the qualities of both the picturesque in painting and the photogenic in a photograph in bengali colloquially and culturally the term chobir moto means picturesque scenic or beautiful where the term chobi can be translated as a photograph as a picture as an image or as picturesque beauty itself the studio as a service provider adver- advertises its abilities of achieving the picturesque beyond the mere photographic a recurrent concern which we would find in the pedagogic and aesthetic writings on photography around the same time <clears throat> the same volume of probahini also published another advertisement poster for the same studio which listed their multiple forms of work from photo engraving art printing catalog and later illustrations this advertisement too accentuating their claim for making superior half tone photographs through their imported technologies printed a photograph of two ostensibly white kids as the ideal evidence of their finesse and pedigree akin to western photography this particular advertisement performs a twofold function it illustrates how the edge of one photographic establishment over the other depended on their ability to produce aesthetically superior photographs 
which would be both photogenic and carry a picturesque beauty in them. Simultaneously, it also suggests how Bengali-owned photographic studios, which often emphasize their indigenous origin as an essential factor to connect to their consumer base, also laid stress on their position of imported image-making apparatus, which is what ensured both the visual clarity and aesthetic superiority of their photographs. <clears throat> this is a print advertisement for D. Rothen and Co. The date and place of publication of this advertisement are uncertain. This one invites the consumers to experience artistic photography. D. Rothen is one of the very few photographic studios located on Cornwall Street, Calcutta, which is now the Bidon Street, um, which is still functioning till to date. D. Rothen's template asserts their identity as artists and photographers as do many other photo studios of the time. The picture template on the advertisement captures Gandhi with a spinning wheel, seated in a hut, a hurricane lamp lying at his feet against a dark backdrop. Much as it is difficult to decipher the nature of the photograph from the depleted image, we can detect ostensible marks of painting on the photograph itself, as is hinted by the pleats on Gandhi's shawl, the checkered window behind his back and other visual cues. So what's intri intriguing in this particular advertisement over and above the conglomeration of artistic and photographic services, however, is the utilization of popular political iconography to appeal to a certain consumer base. Popular political and religious iconography of leaders originated with the help of studios and further proliferated and accumulated their social currency with the help of the photographic studios. The Sharodia Anandobajar Potrika of 1945 carried an advertisement for the Indian Photo Engraving Company, an advertising agency situated in Cornwall Street again. This company started in 1924 in Beniatola Lane by three ex-employees of Ure and Sons. The advertisement carries a figurative motif of two dancing peacocks with a quote from Rabindranath Tagore's poem, Milan or Union. Ami dhara diye chigo, akashero paki, noyone dekhechi tobu nutano akash, tobu nutano akash. I, the free bird from the sky, have been caged willingly, for I have seen your new sky with my own eyes. This one laments the sudden decline in the flourish of trade that happened during Second World War and cautions the consumer consumers how the import of foreign goods has created a competitive market in India. This particular advertisement also underlines the professional collaborations which were commonplace between different advertising, printing, photographic and artistic establishments. Not only was there a possibility of a network of collaborations between the indigenous entrepreneurs, there was also an appeal to the public towards supporting indigenous ventures over the foreign owned ones. At the cusp of India's independence, the profession of photography captures the efforts on the part of Indians toward, towards a revival of a photographic entrepreneurship by boasting their own services, as well as by inviting other such entrepreneurial ventures to associate themselves with the cause. These advertisements also point towards the particular material and technological apparatus which were entering the market in different phases and the kind of cultural impressions they bore on the consumer base. <clears throat> now I will come to the two specific studios where I conducted my field work. One is Seabros and the other one is Studio Divine. For the purpose of this presentation, however, I would just uh, concentrate on Seabros and the field work that I conducted in Seabros. Seabros is one of the oldest photographic studios situated in the Chitpur area. It was first founded by Bhonindra Bhushan Chattopadhyay in 1912 in the Bagbazar area, which later shifted to Chitpur in the year of 1916. After running the studio quite successfully for about four decades, Seabros devoted themselves to the large-scale commercial work commissioned to them by the likes of Ramakrishna Mission, Mohanirban Mott, and other institutions. From the 1980s, tentatively, they started specializing only in the process of photo finishing, which was initially conducted manually and now it involves the digital media alongside. The 
the chatterjee family has been running seabros for three generations now the current proprietor shomo chatterjee is the grand nephew of phonindra bhushan and even the fourth generation shombit chatterjee shomo chatterjee's nephew has taken up photography as his profession this is what the inside of uh, seabros looks like their material resources of camera paper and developing equipment were supplied by companies like kodak agfa indu etc the chemicals for the development and finish of photographs were supplied by agfa mainly but given the scarcity of the material the professionals often made the chemicals themselves according to the set formula which was further supplied to them by the manuals by these companies however these formulae were only set to a certain extent the accuracy and the finesse really dependent on the kind of experience one could develop through the relentless trial and error processes which were conducted within the studio the composition was usually written on the chemicals itself sometimes they were accompanied with manuals their backdrops for these photographs in the studio were always outsourced and not painted in the studio itself by commercial artists located in the nearby areas the usual backdrop of the pillars and the like changed into a flat single color background much later in the 70s the cameras which seabros have preserved include a british ross london tlr made in 1854 a british dalmayr speed made in 1923 swedish hasselblad 500c made in 1952 a german zeiss icon ideal a mentor panorama 2 made in 1953 in east germany all of these cameras are functional even though they are not utilized on a regular basis in the studio anymore for their finish work however they still use their tailboard camera stenopica on a frequent basis they have also preserved a couple of volumes of the british journal of photography as well as the regular user manuals of kodak and agfa in their studio spaces The first photograph on the left is of the various cameras which Seabro still has and the second photograph which is towards the right is the photograph of the tailboard stenopica. Now the camera all along its early history required various forms of pictorial embellishment or technological interventions in the fashioning of the final studio image. the photographic studios everywhere were a place for photographers and artists alike to together cater to the demands for portrait photography and the case of a studio like seabros was no different in the history that it offers of the close implications of the work of artists and photographers within the studio and the central importance that it places on the carefully touched up sauce painted remade and reconstructed photograph which speak of its diverse professional practice in seabros we find two photos of netaji subhas chandra bosch of a, a photograph on an old sage like standing male figure two seated sage like figures two photographs of rabindranath produced by the usis lab photographs of the nahabad khana of dokhineshwar temple an architectural view of the girish ghosh house in bag bazar all of these photographs have come to seabros for the purpose of restoration through means of rephotographing sauce finish and hand painting this one is the photograph of uh, robindranath and helen keller together this one uh, there are two uh, they, there is one photograph which came to seabros for the restoration which then they produced into one bust like and one full sized image of netaji this one the left one is the a photograph of the nahabad khana in dokhineshwar temple and the right one is a reproduction of the girish ghosh house in bag bazar <clears throat> all of these photographs <clears throat> are in the seabro studio they have preserved all these photographs now the story of the studio practices of seabros also shows how such studios would function as important site for professional training and apprenticeship too this created a space of pedagogy which was beyond the boundaries of these institutions the recurrent claim found in the studios that we learnt in the studios and not from the books offer insights into such a history of networks and collaborative image making techniques that went into the making of studio photographs 
so these different processes <clears throat> which made the final product assign the studio photographers the common status of the artist photographers together whose work negotiated the exchange between the fine art of painting the technical art of the camera shot and the performative art of the posed studio photograph through such techno material processes the studios develop their own aesthetic conventions sometimes in marked difference from the popular notions sometimes in conformity to the popular aesthetic conventions the elder brother uh, of sibros shamo chatterjee was keen to point out how these artists were all fine art students and not students of commercial art the artists who worked in collaboration with the photographers in sibros as the finishing of the photographs through source finish color correction and sometimes even backdrop painting could only be performed by students trained in the fine arts the term photo finish entailed this complex process of first enlarging by means of capturing an original photograph then according to the specific measurements which were required by the clientele to correct it in minute pictorial details and then finally finishing it off by a source finish by the same artists these are again some of the photographs which have been reproduced restored finished and color corrected or hand painted even in cases by the sibro studio which are there in their uh, studio itself <clears throat> shamar babu recalls in a personal interview how they used to have a pool of artists <clears throat> who specialized in this special uh, in this art of mending and reviving old photographs to restore them to their finest state through a tedious process that often involved multiple stages of intervention or imagination now he mentions a very interesting anecdote where a person a client gave them a rare photo of his deceased father for retouching finishing and enlargement while talking to the client chatterjee carefully maneuvered him to share the details of his father's profession their family background and realized that his father who of whose photo he has given now used to drive taxis in his youth when this photo was taken the finishing work which was produced had a full bodied image where the figure was seen wearing a wrist watch on his right hand which was not there in the old photo but in the reconstructed photo the finished one the restored one there was a wrist watch on this person's right hand to his surprise the customer was elated to receive the photo as he proclaimed that his father was always wearing a wrist watch on his right hand and appreciated their work emphatically chatterjee then revealed that the taxi drivers in calcutta in and around 1970s used to wear watches on their right wrist such was the trend among them he then added without the abilities to guess correctly the finishing work would often not be possible at all given the tattered and stained conditions of the reference photographs sibo sibros for example has a set of redone photographs of their ancestral figures as well as the popular figures like ramkrishna dev sharada ma and shami vivekanando hung on their walls which clearly depict clues of painting techniques that enhance the iconicity of these images a famous photograph of ramkrishna paramahansa dev adorns the wall of sibros where it receives its daily dose of evening prayer in the photo ramkrishna is seen standing in panchavati with roshik mathur worshiping him at his feet chatterjee believes it is a constructed photograph it originated possibly in a bobaza studio before sibros restored or rather finished it he believes ramkrishna's posture is from a different setting possibly taken indoors which has been transplanted against a delicately painted backdrop of the panchavati with another figure of his low caste devotee roshik mathur which was taken from another photograph and superimposed on it what is more intriguing than the statement is how he arrives at this conclusion as an ardent devotee of ramkrishna chatterjee recurrently stressed the fact that this opinion is only his belief and there could be more to the staging and making of this holy photograph than his humble take 
His training as a professional, however, equips him with a technical knowledge which can separate different layers from this popular print. Even as his belief as a devo devotee says otherwise. Given the probable timeline of the photograph, which was probably the early 1900s, an outdoor photograph was a rarity, as much as low light photographs, which this photograph is. The detailing of the Ponchoboti garden teeming with tropical greenery demonstrates a detailing which was only possible in a painting which has received sauce finish. However, Chatterjee kept on em emphasizing that this photo, even if it is constructed or embellished, is a staging based on the real life incident of Ramakrishna meeting Roshik Methor and struggled to remove any suspicion that might be raised regarding the truth value of this photograph. Chatterjee, who has been a photographer for the past 40 years, the struggle to uphold the truth value of a photograph, even when he is certain of the processes of staging and interception in the composition of this image, as we see in his studio. Coming to the conclusion, I would like to foreground this, the question of the archive that we started with in exploring the history of early photography. Even though there is a large corpus which is available of studio photographs from Bombay or from various personal archives from around India, as Tapatidi also suggested, very little can be found within the professional sites itself. The sites where I initiated my inquiry, the photographic studios, had very few photographs they preserved. Many professionals blamed the floods or termites or the renovations which took place in the studios. Many simply blamed the lack of foresight or interest in preserving photographs, as they believed their job was done once the photographs were delivered to the clients. This sensibility, I believe, is also peculiar to the commercial logic which drove the photographic practices by Bengali entrepreneurs. As opposed to the European photographic studios who really preserved a lot of their photographs and cabinet cards, the indigenous ones hardly saw their occupation as any different from their other commercial ventures. In the co context of visual ethnographic research, however, it pushed my research to see these sites not merely as historic sites, but also as living archives. Conducting interviews with the professionals, tapping onto their memory narratives and oral historical ones became imperative to attempt to construct this history. What started at the question of a lack, however, enriched my research in different ways. The advertisements by the companies producing photographic equipments helped in understanding the material supply, the aesthetic access enabled to the studios by these companies. The advertisements by specific photographic studios helped in understanding the popular aesthetic demands, as well as how the commercial logic of the ventures produced a competitive market for different photographic services. Some specialized in only portrait photography, some did advertisement photographs, some like Studio Divine concentrated on death photography and photographs of the rituals, and some like Seabros then ventured on to photo correction and restoration. <clears throat> on the other hand, <clears throat> sorry, on the other hand, the memorialization of the photographic practices by these professionals also became a window to understand different aspects of family histories. These narratives of memorialization became integral tools in initiating difficult conversations around the practice of photography. When the image archives of these studios proved to be more and more empty, the oral historical narratives actually corroborated and further helped understand the space of professional photography as it happened in early 1900s. Many of these professionals spoke about their practices, their crisis, as well as the economic and social difficulties accelerated by their professional practice. The detailed anecdotes that we just discussed about photographic restoration and many like these <clears throat> helped understand the photographic process in a way never possible just by the photograph itself. They shared many stories, some of them to be used in my research and some of them to be excluded so as not to hamper their family reputation. All in all, the oral histories, the larger ambit of visual resources, as well as the small image archive collated on site, sometimes corroborated with, with each other, <clears throat> sometimes they emerged as distinctly different from the dominant practices of the time. It also illustrated the 
networks pertaining to the everyday social interactions of photography with the locality, its spaces and its public sphere. And finally, the multiple registers of these archives helped provide an understanding of the photography community which was involved in these processes. I think that's, that's about it. And I would wait for uh, questions and comments. This was just a section from my uh, dissertation. So it's an incomplete one perhaps, but um, I am happy to you know, talk about the larger dissertation as well. Thank you. Gone off share screen now. Thank you, uh, Jitisha. That was a very succinctly put together uh, presentation which brought out a number of strands, uh, not just from your dissertation, but which are absolutely central to a larger understanding of photography as technical, as aesthetic, but equally as social practice. And I think your work really took us through this trajectory. Now, um, I'll just set off the discussions uh, with a question uh, on a particular photograph, but also a more general question and then open it up to everybody attending. So for everybody attending this who wish to ask photograph uh, questions, sorry, you can either unmute yourself and directly ask Jigisha, or there's also the chat box option. If you prefer to type in your question, I will read it out and Jigisha can see it directly herself too. Okay, so let me begin with the question of the community with which you ended to. Uh, in a way, uh, the community emerges in different ways in this presentation. Uh, from the sitter, photographer, family, studio kind of relationship, uh, where the photographs from the Chittata Ghosh collection in our archive tell us uh, or suggest several possible relationalities that were emerging between sitters and the camera, between the space of the studio, uh, what kind of sociality were they performing, all of that. Um, what kinds of relationships, uh, you know, we see children and women emerging as subjects of photography in certain elite circles, uh, the studio space allowing them that. And there are many unknown women who are also coming in. And you begin to think then about what these new photographic communities, you know, things that are forged within the space of the studio itself. But from there, I, you lead us, particularly through your, the, the bit you presented on C Brothers, uh, the Chatterjee Brothers, C Bros, uh, which is suddenly the sitter goes out of it, not from all the studios, but this particular studio then begins to work with a different community, largely religious institutions or other institutions who come to them to revive old photographs, right? So they're performing a different task. It's a different, we could think of this as another community too, but it's not that relationality anymore. And what is it therefore? So how do we then think about a community that is both being renegotiated and transforming itself? So one is the community of expertise, right? So there are photographic studios, there are new cameras, new equipment, new techniques, new clientele, and they're competing with each other, but they're also perhaps collaborating and they're artists commercial artists, those who do the touching up work or collaborating. So, so there's a community of practice that becomes very clear. It's a local community. Uh, the technique, technology may come from elsewhere, but the community that is forged is very local. It could also be a community of those who visit the studios, etc. That does come. But I'm also thinking then about a different set of relations and here i'm therefore this leads me then to the particular photograph that i had a question about and which you explored wonderfully which is the ramkrishna photograph the poncho Bhutti, which occurs in many many devotees homes etc now 
When you take a pot, it's clearly a collage. So you take a Ramakrishna image of his famous mantra pose. So Ramakrishna is, we know, appearing before the camera. So this is a known fact. And in one of the Shampukur missions, they preserve the camera that photographed Ramakrishna. So the camera becomes a sacred object because that's what thinking it is where which saw the person before it. And then you have the that photograph of him performing, moving into different collages. So Christopher Pinney, for instance, uses one in his book where the three of them uh, Vivekanondo, they appear as photographs and they would never have been sitting in devotion at the same time. Here it seems that they're taking Roshit Mathur and performing it. The 1900 date is what I had a question about because Ramakrishna is dead by then, right? So in some sense, the miracle occurs in the late years, so in the 1880s. So I'm trying to understand the different components of it. So uh, where you take the Roshit method form, the Panchabuti. So historically, it is talking about an incident that occurred in the 1880s. Maybe it is being reconstructed first in the 1900s uh, when the photograph begins to circulate, uh, the mission is formed. And much later, of course, it becomes a household item. So there's more and more demand for it. Nobody questions the authenticity of this because it's, so here is a very interesting object as you show of the devotional and the technical, and at the same time, what you will call the photographic analytical eye, which can take apart, which knows that this is how this was put together without any way taking away from the power of the photograph. So this is what I wanted you to uh, maybe not even answer, think about, but maybe talk about the community a bit more if you want. Uh, thank you, Tapu uh, for pointing that out because um, as this was entirely this this conversation which was conducted with Shama Chatterjee, who is now the proprietor of the studio, and he said that this photograph was first produced in a Bobaza studio, and then it came to Seabros for the finishing work to be done. So in that way, I'm pretty sure that the different layers or the different components of the photograph itself, or even the backdrop of Ponchabuti and the detailing which was done then, were perhaps already there during Ramakrishna's lifetime. But then when it was coming to be constructed as a single photograph, that perhaps happened in the early 1900s. So that would be probably my understanding of it. And I you know this was an elaborate network which about the community itself where then we see that one part of the work is being done in a bobaza studio which was also perhaps a bengali owned studio and then for the finishing work it's coming to the Seabros because by then they were slowly moving into only doing the finishing or the restoring work beyond their photographic practices as well so i think it speaks about that uh, the 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 you know interaction between the religious um, um, outfits as well as these photographic communities how this this particular you know a kind of iconic image is being produced with various networks sort of enabling it enabling their iconicity as well as how there was also a certain kind of network between different bengali um, owned studios itself but I'll think about it. I'll think about this particular photograph. Yeah, because the question of the community comes through very powerfully uh, when you think of death and photography, which I know is a large part of your chapter, uh, where the cremation ground becomes a photographic studio. But anyway, but I think it's it will be very interesting from the late 19th when Bengalis are entering photographic studios to be photographed, both European and Indian, into this. The idea of what the community is may be interesting to pull through. Okay. I don't see any photographs in the chat uh, comments, but I, I'm inviting everybody to unmute themselves and ask their questions. Yeah, I, I have a little uh, point about this particular for this particular photograph, uh, uh, whether or not it actually might be the case that this uh, photograph actually circulated among believers as a photographic evidence of the event itself, that in a sense, this, this was meant to persuade people 
that this if the story that was was, was known uh, was actually a real event and this is the photograph of the event you see this is where it's quite possible that the photograph had, had already emerged as an account of a reality which is out there which is a kind of direct evidence a direct perception of something that's happening uh, rather than a a uh, a, a reconstruction by an artist or painter. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I actually in the dissertation, I actually look into how the photograph, uh, photographic medium is a um, sort of, you know, being portrayed as the evidence for different kinds of su supernatural events, actually. Um, the Theosophical Society is using it. Uh, it's being used in Europe and the US as well as in Bengal in the Theosophical Society documents. Uh, someone like uh, PC, uh, PC Sharkar Sr. He uses it as a proof of his um, you know, hypnotism and all such acts as that this is the evidence that this actually happens. And we see that happening. For the purpose of this presentation, I sort of left that supernatural element and the death photography um, uh, out of this presentation. But I, uh, I have looked into that. And that's very, very important that how this, this particular evidence like quality, this object of certain kind of objective nature that photography uh, sort of embodies with the practice. And when we look into the, the very uh, ways in which the photograph was being constructed, we see how much, um, how many different ways there are so that the photograph is being constructed as such. Hi, Jigisha. Uh, I have a couple of interrelated questions. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the presentation. I really like your work, as you know. So um, um, in the second slide, you showed us uh, this location of the North Calcutta studio. And I was uh, wondering if you had a chance to look at the small studio on the other side of the river. So, uh, I mean, you may not have, but I was just, because we both have connections to the other side of the river, I was just wondering if you had a chance to look at them. And the other thing is, um, uh, while you were conducting research in these studios, could you find any record of the people who worked in the dark room or the apprentices or the painters who worked with them? Because I heard uh, your con conversation with the proprietor and the people who were looking from above about, um, and, and, doing the business, but who are these little known people? Because I had a hard time finding and I mean, I couldn't find any. So I would be very curious to know what your uh, thoughts are or if you could find any um, details about these people. I mean, who mostly go unrecorded in histories of photography. And um, the other thing is, I was wondering why uh, the studios in North Kolkata, the Bengali owned studios didn't keep their records. And then I was trying to think about the British studios for whom a lot of records can be found. Uh, and I was wondering, did these um, indigenous studios, indigenous owned studios, did any series or albums say something like Views of Calcutta, which Bone and Shepherd would very much do, and then have those views of India, views of Calcutta, whatever, um, marked with numbers. So return customers who order reprints of the same uh, same negative. So could you see this numbering of the negatives or anything that can indicate um, like a larger community of uh, people involved in this uh, photographic process where they are coming back for reprints? And perhaps that's one of the reasons why they keep or don't keep. And uh, finally, one more point, if you could just talk a little about the points of divergences and convergences with uh, the British owned studios. I mean, I'm just curious to know uh, how you look at these points of intersection and how the indigenous studios are uh, kind of working as points of fissures in this more imperial practice, if you may say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ranudi, uh, for those questions. I'll try to go one by one. Um, firstly, I haven't had a chance to look at the other side of the river, so to speak. I do know there were some uh, photographic studios, early photographic studios in Uttarpara, in Chinsura, in even like, you know, other places like Krishnanagar, etc. But unfortunately, I haven't had the opportunity to look into them. I did go to Uttarpara, but it was not 
um you know it was very difficult to track down the family because the studio was almost defunct which is why it was a very uh, muddled process of field work but i do hope to look into that uh, at a given point of time but uh, we can talk more about that as well um about the second one yes uh, i did primarily talk to the proprietors but there were others as well who you know like for example these um, these these background workers so to speak they often have like you know they are just called kaka when i ask the name of this particular person who work in the studio mm -hmm. he would say that i am just called kaka he would himself say that and he would not give out his name right and they have not been a part of the family but they are also always introduced as you know they are just like family and there are also some very old artists who used to come very regularly to this studio spaces if especially in the evenings for a tea or an adda or something like that and they would reminisce about you know their their pasts of working as um artists who have been trained in uh, the government art mm -hmm. school as well so there are a certain kind of you know the these information uh, about the people especially who worked with the finishing work that can be found but not you know the the regular workers who did perhaps the the especially the work in the dark room or especially the you know more mundane work of printing mm -hmm. of 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 developing the photographs from the negatives all of that that is not as found as but the, there is uh, some information as you said it's very difficult but there can be some information that could be found mm -hmm. about the um, artists especially who were trained in uh, government art school and they were also known as fine artists that's why there is some information available on that mm -hmm. um about the other one yes uh, there is i haven't been able to find um, any of the ventures which were about you know preserving their work so to speak i think because in cbros for example uh, why we have at least a very small amount of small section of an image archive is because or the cameras because they continued to work with those cameras like these cameras still function they still use it in some limited capacity but they still use those cameras within the studios itself but there was no as such um, you know a uh, venture to have an album to have like a a uh, uh, documentation of sorts which were very prevalent as i said also mm -hmm. in the european studios so there is no there was no sense of documentation and i think uh, in my experience it has been like you know this kind of a sensibility that why do we need to document the moment that we deliver our photographic prints to the customer it's done right but on the other hand when we see the uh, uh, iconic images of say religious icons uh we see that they have preserved at least a section of those sort of photographs within the studios themselves so for mundane photographs for say photographs of different families for different customers for the different kinds of reprints or re refinishing that they have done there is no documentation that can be found but for different religious icons on the other hand which is also to do with the kind of backgrounds uh, the studio professionals come from the kind of uh, backgrounds that the family who owns the studio they come from but we find those images uh, there but there is nothing where you know one could order reprints from etc etc mm -hmm. um again connecting this to your last question which was the you know how did they actually sometimes um, conform uh, with each other and how were their practices divergent from each other uh, for cbros uh, for example uh, because they worked with you know the, the it's shobha bazar so there there are so mm -hmm. many of the um you know pandals of durga puja etc etc they they also worked extensively with photographing the practice of you know the idol making so in that sense uh, in terms of the content that they are uh, by virtue of their location by virtue of what kind of social spheres they come from that they are capturing they that these spaces were out of access for european photographers mostly right uh, for the studio professionals but because this was a studio which was situated within a uh, shobha bazar itself so they could then go out and uh, sort of capture these images take a de make a detailed documentation of these processes they also have some stereoscopes uh, stereoscopic slides which also have you know these durgas uh, <clears throat> which were painted and for uh, the slide show purpose as well which were there there 
for uh, divine studio as well which i look into my dissertation i didn't speak about it in this uh, particular presentation mm -hmm. where we see that you know it solely because it's next to the nimtala ghat it solely uh, and predominantly sort of um, did death photography so in that sense they would go out to the ghats they would uh, because it was a, a documentation for documentation purpose that you know a person is actually deceased uh, it started as a documentation purpose but then it also ventured onto something more of a memorial practice right and that was also something because again european photographers would not have had access to these you know intimate ritualistic spaces of um, primarily hindu families who would be coming to the nimtala ghats for burning their dead and which is why we would see that you know there are bone and shepherd photographs of the nimtala ghat which just uh, portrays which just captures like you know burning uh, pyres mm -hmm. but when we come to say the the photographs which are taken uh, by studios for specifically the purpose of you know uh, uh, remembering the dead or memorializing the dead we see an intimate close up of the person we see whoever where the shoshan jatris whoever would accompany mm -hmm. them there is a photograph of that you know as in terms of it's also a paying a paying a certain kind of respect to the deceased as well as the people who are accompanying them right so in terms of access um a, these these two kinds of studios would vary in terms of you know what um how they understand a certain kind of situation especially involving people these studios and their uh, photographs would vary in my understanding but mm -hmm. i would say that that also comes um, very very vividly that also translates especially in the ritual photographs thank you we uh... I have a question in the chat box, so let me read that out while others uh, are also asking the question. Uh, this is from Sheikh uh, Abdul Ami. Is there any significance of Chitpur Chorbagan lithography in the development of photography practice in colonial Calcutta? I think your reference to Calcutta Art Studio is important, so. Uh, and also, you know, there are many, many new lithography studios which are coming up there in that region. Um, thank you for the question. I think, yeah, uh, it was actually um, very essential to the uh, development of photography in colonial Calcutta, especially because, as you saw in the advertisements, they're mostly also lithograph prints. So the knowledge about, you know, there is a certain kind of photographic studio, they offer these kind of services, et cetera, et cetera which are then being carried out in journals in you know newspapers in magazines etc for the purpose of publicity then we see that the lithographs are actually you know becoming essential for that kind of ensuring that kind of a publicity but on the other hand when the photographs themselves are also entering the you know uh, the the space of advertisements right when uh, photographs are then included within the advertisement themselves for different kind of commodities, products, or services, we then also see that the photographs are also being reproduced through means of lithographs as well. So yes, in this case, uh, especially for, for you know the the purpose when the photograph is you know uh, being mass produced in a sense or being produced on a large scale, the lithographic studios really come uh, into the play. small point to add there would also be interesting since a lot of the lithography presses are doing religious pictures right so there's new mythological iconography in a realist style so again interesting to juxtapose a real life religious icon like ram krishna then entering this world of collages lithography and entering the world of religious pictures, right? So, but he enters as a living person, as a person who once lived uh, with that sense of authentication of what he performed. But it would be again interesting to juxtapose a figure like that coming into popular religious iconography side by side with the work that Kashari Pala, Chol Pala, Calcutta students. Do they have also used to be these uh, mini kaj uh, where they produce certain kinds of memorabilia from photographs where they etched it onto you know different kind of prints and produced memorabilia especially with religious icons okay 
other questions? I have a, a small point. Uh, if you go back to the map that you showed at the beginning, uh, the locations of various studios, I was trying to tally the numbers that you have and the addresses, and they don't seem to tally. The, I, I don't know if there's a confusion there because it, it, you know, the, the addresses don't match with the locations that uh, you show on the map. Maybe, uh, maybe I, I didn't check properly. But you, you may look at that once more, whether, uh, whether those, those numbers that you have um, are actually the correct ones. OK, sir, I'll look into that. The list was mostly collated from Shiddhartha Ghosh's uh, you know, uh, collection of all the photographic studios. No, I, I'm sure the addresses are correct. But the location on the map, when you have the numbers one, two, three, uh, I, you know, they seem to be all over the place. Okay, Are there more questions? Otherwise, uh, on this, uh, maybe perhaps this question of how you locate them on the map. Uh, I know that you grafted it on the, the addresses, trying to locate them with it. Uh, maybe useful to think about. Uh, but on the question that Ranu raised on why Bengali photographic studios have not maintained an archive of the kind that, say, the Shahid Para studios did, it's interesting to think that we know the Born and Shepherd archives was burnt, and there was really no documentation done of it. Um, we don't, I mean, Amit Ali's studio was meticulously maintained, we know. And now, of course, it's moved and it's now been housed with his daughters as a whole trust form. Um, I can give one example in very recent times of an Indian owned studio in the Shadpara, which was the uh, Bombay Photo Stores, where I know that when the owners gave it up, uh, they actually just literally got rid of all the negatives. If you, think, you know, this Bombay photo stores was our time in a way that whenever we needed an official photograph taken, it was Bombay photo stores. Now, when the family decided to sell off the premises, uh, they actually got rid of all the negatives. Only thing they preserved was the proprietor Jayant Patel's own photo right uh, which was then given over i think now it's with the al Qasi collection they were looking for buyers uh ranu and i had gone to look at the collection they were looking for buyers really for the giant hotel so again it's interesting that even say a thriving profession family like that never thought it was worthwhile to ask an archiving enterprise to come and you know, do something with the negatives. Uh, instead, they believed that it was completely dispensable. I think they put up some advertisement saying, if anybody wished to come and pick up negatives with a number, we may be able to pick them. So, you know, I think that is also quite interesting on the value that this now would have. So the archiving of photography, uh, when Shittat Ghosh was collecting, there was no market value. People were handing over the photographs. And now we know photographs are bought and sold. There's a whole market from stock photography. So it both enters archives, but it also enters the open markets now to be bought and sold. Not just colonial photography, but even those of it. So just wanted to therefore think therefore that photographs with uh, studios with much less resources, say like Studio Divine or even them, it's not surprising therefore that uh, there was no interest really in maintaining uh, the records, the negative. Can I ask a question, Abhadidi? Oh, of course. Where are you? Can I am. Um, can you hear me? Yes. 
Yeah. So, uh, Jisha, I'm I'm uh, going to uh, sort of ask the uh, caste and gender question. Uh, you know, which is I mean, you give us you speak a little bit about the kind of of European community versus the the Bengali community, and. Um, uh, kind of contrast these two, right? Uh, but I'm wondering whether, you know, the kind of material practices that you talk about um, and also uh, the uh, processes of apprenticeship that you said, you know, like the space of the studio is really uh, a way to, to uh, learn. And in other contexts, we know that apprenticeship is a, a, a familial sort of uh, track. Um, and so I'm wondering whether there is any way to actually, in this kind of social history of photography, kind of get a sense about, about whether there are any kind of, of uh, um, you know, new relationships or new ideas around caste and, and uh, gendered sort of participation that are emerging around both the physical space of the, the studio, uh, but also, you know, the, the materials that are being handled and, and so on. And we know that happens for print, uh, and that produces also a kind of split, uh, at least in, in Bombay, uh, you know, about who becomes a printer versus who becomes a publisher and then editor and so on. And so I'm wondering whether that happens and, you know, the kaka, the ubiquitous kaka that you kind of spoke about might also be a, 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 a kind of barrier to thinking about what kind of caste relationships, uh, you know, uh, underwrote these uh, emerging kind of spaces and practices. So I was wondering if you could kind of either speculate or just elaborate on that a little bit. Um, thank you, Prachidi. I actually uh, left it out for this presentation, but uh, I do look at it in my dissertation, uh, which is especially this caste relation and the gender relation. I would come to the gender relation later. If we talk about the caste relation, um, it especially gets, you know, uh, vividly sort of, uh, we can understand it vividly when we see the death photographs, because we see that these two studios uh, in various scales, both Seabros and Divine Studio, they engaged with death, pho death, death photography. And they would go on to the space of the different ghats to capture, you know, either the burning fires or the people who would be accompanying in, in, in that uh, procession uh, for, for burning the deads. And we would see that, you know, both these studios, in this case of the, uh, these two studios, both these studios are Brahmin owned uh, 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 studios. And we would see that, you know, initially as uh, both of the professionals or the owners of the studios spoke about, initially there was a huge amount of hesitance about, you know, uh, going and photographing the dead because it was considered the impure uh, sort of domain which was reserved for, you know, uh, a certain kind of, uh, you know, uh, a certain certain caste and also the Brahmins would be sort of, you know, performing these last rites. They were also sort of seen as the lower rung of Brahmins, right? So whenever these people would be going out to, wear, to, to, to photograph the dead bodies, they would be coming back to the studios and they would be doing like, you know, a cleaning and purging ritual before then entering the studio space itself, right? So in that case, we find um, how there is, a, I mean, on one hand, the, the location itself and the demands of professional photography, which is there is a huge demand for uh, photographing the dead, right? And there are so many other studios which are now defunct, which we could not locate at this point, which actually uh, sort of emerged uh, alongside the ghats, uh, especially because of this burning of the dead and the kind of demand that it sort of, you know, uh, entailed. And in this case, we see because of the location, because of, you know, the economic sort of uh, demands, we see that there is a new kind of negotiation that these, these people who are then, uh, you know, on one hand economic or uh, <clears throat> on one hand entrepreneurs, on the other hand, they are also very, very uh, conscious about their upper caste Brahmin identities. They're now then, you know, almost forced to sort of negotiate their identity vis-a-vis -vis the demands of the profession itself and uh, you know he also saw so much that also said that you know initially the the purging and cleaning rituals etc etc they, they were very uh, sort of you know um, they were very strictly in place and eventually as time passed they also sort of you know uh, 
entered into a more fluid ground that yes it's okay you have just ventured out and you are just returning so maybe like you know uh, just just uh, putting your hands in ganga jal or something like that that would be uh, the entire cleaning and purging that would serve the same purpose uh, which earlier used to happen through you know um, taking thorough baths and doing the entire sort of um, rituals religious rituals to sort of cleanse oneself of that um, of venturing on to this other space so we see that how the in in their minds or in their in this kind of a construction how the studio space is then imagined how the space outside into the the burning hearts are then imagined and how as brahmins they are then forced to negotiate uh, 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 their caste identity vis a vis the demands of photography in terms of gender for example <clears throat> it doesn't come as uh, uh, as in a in as detailed manner is my in my work uh because uh, you know there are uh, so many personal collections like say for example monobina and debolina we see that um there are so many of these you know women photographic women there are then other uh, <clears throat> uh you know the first uh women owned uh, photographic studio which is being set in calcutta uh but in this case however within the photography these two photographic studios there were you know till date there are no women professional Professionals in the studios, and it's only the the relationship that they have vis-a-vis -vis, you know uh, uh, the gender question would be then how to you know to to sort of understand what kind of demands a specific client who who is a woman um, with their class and caste uh, sort of you know backgrounds then might have, and how to translate that that into the photograph that they produce, right? How to how to direct the kind of pose that they would have how to um you know what kind of attires to prescribe while clicking a photograph and all these questions then come into play but you are right there is so few um you know so few details available about what goes on in the background and if there is a a, a distinction in terms of who is doing what kind of work that needs to be looked into more thoroughly in 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 the studios Thank you. There's one uh, question follow up on this. Since you've looked at the uh, studios, uh, you see, because I'm, if you compare this with the printing press, in the printing press, there were very clear caste distinctions uh, in the different kinds of functions of the press. You know, proofreaders, for instance, were invariably upper caste, uh, but compositors, so, you know. In the old days, when you had to do it by hand, compositors could be of different castes. I've seen, but the machine man, the person who actually operated the machine, who actually had to work with ink and grease and all that, I have never seen in any of the old presses in College Street an upper caste machine man. Machine men were either low caste Hindu or Muslim. Uh, now I wonder if the photographic studio. when it comes to working in the in the dark room and working with you know chemicals and so on whether this actually was a consideration because so there could that, be the that that was the thing behind my question as well yeah. see there could be there could be the uh, other argument i i don't know if it actually operated that this was actually not to be confused with any of the traditional occupations that somehow this was a new scientific thing operating with it's like working in a laboratory and so this was all right for upper caste people to do this work i don't know whether that 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 worked or not uh, because certainly you know this is the interesting thing that happens in the pharmacy in the pharmacy for instance the compounder who was actually working with a lot of uh, you know chemicals and other substances which otherwise would have been required uh, you know regarded as impure it was not a barrier to upper caste people being employed as compounders in in pharmacies but i i i wonder what the situation was in the in the in the photographic studio jigesha i have a question for you may i talk now we going to answer to partho uh, may i come in i mean i just had a point to add to partho's question you have to unmute yourself and uh, then yes uh i am unmuted aren't i 
My speaker is on. Yeah, yeah. Shall I speak now? Yeah, sure. I was just wondering, you know, you gave us such a fantastic talk on this uh, Chitpur uh, Chatterjee shop that I have seen and been to. And uh, while listening to you, I thought uh, whether it is possible to compare and contrast the studio of Darjeeling, which uh, has, uh, I mean, I've been there from 1950 till 2013. I've been visiting Darjeeling and I always made an effort to walk in. They've diversified a lot, but the photographs that they have uh, displayed and this don't sell them, even if you wish to, are of the Kanchenjunga, various moments, then people, the Bhutias, the Nepalis, even Bengalis uh, of uh, the area. Would it be possible to compare and contrast with the Chatterjee Studios in the studio, I was wondering. But there is no picture of Ram Krishna, interesting. I think they were more on the nature, the landscape of the Himalayas than on persons were really those hill people that they captured, tea workers and the poor people of Darjeeling area. I was just wondering, uh, did you come across that history, their history? We know so little about it otherwise. Just quickly come in and mention that contrary to what all of us think, the Das studio is not a Bengali owned studio. Uh, we know from Claire Harris's work and also Pajunna's work that yes. there's actually a Tibetan owned practice. And I forget where the term Das comes, but it's not a Bengali Das. So this explains, and a lot of it, Das studio worked with the question of the ethnographic practice of photographing, you know, the hill spaces, the people, etc. So there is something on that studio in uh, the book called Photography in Tibet of Claire Harris. And I was really surprised to know that it's not a Bengali connection at all. So just to put it out there. So, I mean, not surprising that there's no Ramakrishna up there too. But they claim to be, you know, uh, they speak in Bengali, and uh, they claim to be also descendants of uh, the old man who created the studio. You know, that at some point it must have changed proprietorship, but it begins as a yeah. studio. But I, as I said, we will have to follow. But uh, anyway, of course. Thank you. Uh, Topadini, may I just like, add to something Parthada was interested in? Sure. Uh, so, yeah, Parthada, that's a precise reason I was interested in Jigesha's work to look for people and the details uh, and their details. Uh, the few studios that I have looked into, like in the um, Esplanade area, and there was one studio and, and, and the name is Slipping. So they dealt both in guns, ammunitions and photography. And, uh, and they were very clear on the fact that the people who worked in their dark rooms, at least, they were low caste people. And, and it, it, so the dark room, as far as my understanding goes and my experience uh, goes, uh, it was very much like any uh, like printing press than a pharmacy. So that's what I figured, but I could be like wrong when expanding the scope of the research. You know, a lot of photographers set up their own dark rooms too, we know. So I suppose uh, the dark room could mean different things uh, depending on its location and use also. Okay. Now, let me read out the question from Ushmaya Dutta. Did you find any photographs that were non-visual in nature or photos that went beyond the images of people, architecture, photos which did not have any particular information to share as such? I'm also interested to know whether staged photography was happening outside the studio spaces or not, and if so, then of what kind? Okay, uh, <clears throat> I guess uh, the question about, you know, Darjeeling uh, photo studios has been uh, sort of responded to by Tapatiti, and I have not, uh, this in this research, I have not looked at uh, you know, uh, photo studios beyond a certain section in Calcutta. Um, 
coming to ushmeo's question there where um, you know i was particularly not looking um, you know whatever little image resources we had from the pro pro from the studio spaces itself there were not so many uh, photographs which we might call experimental photographs or something which did not uh, you know consist of um and uh, as you were saying that a particular information to share as such because they were mostly um dealing with you know customer requests client requests etc and not really venturing on to you know these two particular studios there might be other studios who were sort of taking up interesting work on their own but these two were specifically dealing with client demand so in that case i was not able to come across any uh, photographs of that kind as such um about the second question there are several uh, you know uh, photographs like the zenana photographs which have been worked uh, on by many scholars there are also say the photographs of picnics or family occasions which were then staged on the outside space beyond the studio but then again the the entire process of commissioning uh, especially in the early times and that process of commissioning a, a particular kind of photograph or a particular studio to take certain photographs was so expensive that it was also only limited to a certain section of the 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 people right so those kind of photos where the staging is happening even outside the studio space are available and they are largely available within personal archives um coming back to this question of ranudi of prachidi and uh, parthuda i would like to say that you know i need to look into it because uh, apart from looking into how the family which owned uh, these studios and especially because they were from the brahmin community how they were negotiating the demands of death photography particularly i was looking in looking more into that and especially also because i was looking into a certain kind of history where you know all these information were hardly available in terms of um who were those i was communicating with that did not um i was not able to break ground in terms of uh, the 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 cast composition of you know the photographic practice where one is considered as an artist and the others more perhaps as workers that kind of a uh, a uh, uh, composition i need to look into if and how i can find resources but yeah i need to think more about that what is happening in the dark room what kind of people are associated with the different processes and also you know to think about the dark room as it moves from a commercial studio space to maybe a photographer's own space because we know with print making for instance that when print making enters the artist studios enters the art schools and then enters artist studios so again you know it's the commercial context locations you know as you said uh, even with people entering the shashan ghat the cremation ground and coming away uh, things loosen sometimes these things but i'm also interested that when these practices move from some traditional occupational sites and spaces and then they become part of other spheres of professional art practices uh, obviously then handling ink grease press you look at an art studio you look at an art school studio do these barriers then may not remain in place right so uh, but again what kinds of students are coming into art schools data again a cast question occupational questions will come okay there's a question and i think we will end with this because um, it's been uh, a very very interesting discussion uh, shonita mukaji uh, thanks you jigisha for a fascinating presentation i was just curious to know whether you can throw some light on the photographing of the red light areas during colonial era and the relationship between photography and the question of liminal spaces alongside the idea of permissibility um thanks shonita ji for uh, the question i have not looked into that uh, in my research but i'm sure that you know especially in uh, studios or professionals who were uh, sort of um, specializing in theater photography or uh, zenana photography or even photographs of advertisements uh, where um, you know uh, the models are also entering uh, 
sometimes from the red light areas as well especially within theater photography because we know especially in this area of shobha bazar chitpur that there was a kind of fluid um uh, uh, interaction between the theater community as well as the courtesan community so in that sense there might be uh, you know professional photographers who have extensively captured that but unfortunately in my research i have not uh, have not looked into that that part somebody raised the question on whether these albums are coming out uh, i think i know from the work of bijli raj who presented in the earlier session that many of these photographs are bringing up albums of semi pornographic or semi erotic pictures for limited circulation and there i think i think the question of the link between uh the red light community and these photographic studios could well be explored there in the sense that who are these women who are posing semi nude in these studios and they're circulating side by side with painting so that again you know so you have a him and mulchum that painting and you have bhavani lahas photographs and many others of that kind so again who were these women and i think there could well be a connection then between locationality of these and who are the women who supplied 